This meeting is being recorded. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight for our lecture with Dr. Barrett Woods um, on evaluation and treatment of spinal pathology. Dr. Woods is one of the spine surgeons here with us at Rothman Orthopedics. He sees patients in our Egg Harbor Township and our Washington Township or Sewell offices um, on the New Jersey side. Um, Dr. Woods, just so you know, this lecture is open to patients from New Jersey and Pennsylvania, so you know you might get you know both sides of it. Um, but as Dr. Woods said, um, he's going to be lecturing, and we're open to questions throughout. So you'll see if you hover your mouse towards the bottom, there's a chat feature. If you go ahead and click that, you can type your questions. Leslie's going to be monitoring that um, to ask Dr. Woods any questions you know as we go along. So whatever you have, feel free to ask. Um, no question is silly. A lot of the questions that you have are also questions that other people have and you just don't know it. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started and Dr. Woods, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Leslie, for putting this together. I think these opportunities for us to sit down and talk are, are so, so important. You know, COVID has been challenging on, on everyone. And so for us to be able to have an opportunity to sit down and exchange information, is really, really important. Uh, it's interesting because when Nicole and Leslie asked me to give this talk, obviously I was happy to do it, but the time was something that made me a little concerned. I have three boys at my house. My sons are seven, five, and three, and I can tell you if I was home, there was no way that we would be able to get through this lecture uh, in any type of uh, you know successful manner without my boys interrupting. So really nice to uh, have an opportunity to talk to you guys. Certainly um, put any questions that you might have throughout the um, presentation uh, in the chat box, and then we can address those as quickly as we can. Really the gist of this is to kind of discuss some of the common problems that I see in the office, some of the common issues with the predominantly lumbar spine, but we'll also, also talk about cervical spine, and what our options are for treatment, what spinal surgery is, what it does, what it fixes, and what it does not fix. Uh, I am uh, originally from Pittsburgh. I went to undergrad at Clemson University. I'm in six, this is my sixth year in practice at the Rothman Institute. Uh, I did my fellowship at Thomas Jefferson Rothman Institute and have been uh, in practice in the South Jersey uh, area ever since. Uh, in my practice as a spinal surgeon, I treat all adults. The majority of the conditions that I treat are degenerative, so wear and tear as we age, but I also take care of patients with trauma, infections, deformities, uh, scoliosis, uh, all of those things. So uh, we will briefly touch on some of each of these topics and please uh, do not uh, hesitate to put a question in the chat box and I'll try to address it as, to the best of my abilities. So when you, when you think about spine problems, a lot of the problems that we see in people, particularly people as we age, uh, surround the intervertebral disc. Uh, and the intervertebral disc is a very fascinating structure. Uh, it is the cushion that serves throughout in between the bones and the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine, and it, it serves as a shock absorber. It is the largest tissue in our body that does not have disc, ha does not have any nerves in it. So the actual disc itself is aneural. There is no nerve in the disc itself. So it's the largest aneural structure within our body, and it is a cushion, a shock absorber, uh, between the bones. It allows for motion. It is composed of an outer segment called the annulus, which is like a tire, and an inner portion called the nucleus pulposus, which is the jelly. That nucleus pulposus sucks in water. That water is what provides kind of the shock absorbing capability of the disc. And as we age, the disc dries out. It loses the ability to maintain hydration. And as a result, bones start to bump together. Uh, and you develop arthritis. If you have a disc herniation, uh, as is pictured in this image to my right, um, a disc herniation can compress nerves. If nerves in the spine are compressed, that can cause pain in your legs. I can tell you, my mother, um, I lived with her during medical school. She saw how hard I worked to get here, and she called me, and she was having a lot of pain in her leg, and I told her that the problem was really likely coming from her back, and she didn't believe me. My own mother, who saw me go through medical school, said, it's, it's not my back, it's my leg. And the reality is, if you have compression of a nerve in your back, that will cause pain in your legs. And we'll talk about that, expand upon that, that point a little bit more as the lecture proceeds. 
So the intervertebral disc uh, is very similar to a tire. There's an outer ring, there's an inner gelatinous portion. When it's healthy and the nucleus pulposus is well hydrated, it works very well. What happens as we age, that nucleus pulposus begins to dry out uh, and you start to ride on rim. And when you're riding on rim, you bend the rim and you develop arthritis. Arthritis can compress bones uh, can, and can, can compress nerves in your, in your back and that's what ultimately leads to the problem. We all get disc degeneration to a various degree. Uh, there is a genetic predisposition for disc degeneration. Some people get it worse than others. Disc degeneration can be caused by trauma. So if that outer ring is damaged, just like hitting a pothole, that will facilitate disc degeneration. And there's things that we can do that can exacerbate disc degeneration, like smoking can lead to drying out the disc. Obesity, um, you know, not taking care of yourself can lead to it. But the fact of the matter is we all as we age, we'll have some degree of disc degeneration. This is a uh, histologic cross-section of, of, of disc, uh, a healthy disc and a, and a disc that's degenerated. And what you can see in this picture on the left is um, a healthy disc has a, a differentiation between the outer ring and the inner jelly. You can kind of see how shiny that center portion is. And as we age, it becomes fibrotic. The disc becomes kind of one tissue it loses its elasticity. It loses its ability to kind of shock absorb between the bones. Uh, and as a result, you develop arthritis. So this is a, this is a phenomenon that we all deal with to a certain extent. Uh, and with dealing with lumbar spine problems, it's important to understand lumbar spine anatomy. This is a normal MRI, a sagittal, which is looking at, from, looking at the patient from the side and then a cross section. Uh, in the lumbar spine, uh, the spinal cord itself typically ends uh, between uh, T12 and L2. In this particular patient, the bottom of the spinal cord is at L2. At the bottom of the spinal cord, nerve roots that that's supply strength and sensation to your legs emanate. And so each nerve in your, in your lumbar spine supplies a very specific portion of your leg, both sensation and strength. Uh, and that's why we call it the cauda equina or the horse's tail. And so this is kind of a, 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 um, a drawing kind of illustrating that, that, that horse's tail, those lumbar nerve root roots. And you can see at each level in the spine, a nerve root exits. This is actually an intraoperative picture showing a laminectomy. So someone who had compression of the nerves, the nerves are contained inside of a sac. That is the fecal sac, and that is this thing that you can visualize here. And that inside of that sac is cerebral spinal fluid, which nourishes and protects the nerves. And so when we do a lumbar decompression, you can see the fecal sac itself. If you open up the fecal sac, you can see the individual nerve roots. And that is not something we commonly have to do, but occasionally if there's a problem with inside, inside of the sac itself, um, you might have to open up the sac. Most of the problems that we deal with are due to external compression of that fecal sac and the nerve roots in the back. Disc herniations, arthritis, uh, we will discuss that in a little bit more depth. When someone comes to me with a lumbar spine problem, the beauty about spine surgery is it's really trying to figure out a, a puzzle. A person presents with difficulty walking, pain, or weakness in a certain location, and my mind is working trying to figure out where the problem is even before I look at their imaging studies. In order for me to do an operation, they need to have clinical, clinical findings which are consistent with physical exam findings, um, which you would expect with an MRI which shows nerve compression in that distribution. And so that was a tongue-tied way of saying everything in the, in the lumbar spine is connected. Each nerve root supplies a specific portion of, the, of their leg. So, a very common thing you see is people with pain shooting down the side of their leg. If you look at this dermatomal chart on the left, that shows the L5 nerve root is what supplies the side of the leg down past, past the knee into the top of the foot. And so if I see someone with pain shooting down their leg, I'm thinking about where the problem may be, and then we look at an MRI to see if they actually have nerve compression in that distribution. So it really is kind of like solving a puzzle. And that's one of the fun things about spinal surgery. I see a lot of patients um, in the office uh, and everyone has a horror story about back surgery. Um, I think the thing to understand is that there are limitations to what back surgery can and can't fix. 
the things that back surgery can fix, it fixes very well. And the thing, and the reason that you have an operation or the reason you should consider an operation is if you have nerve root compression resulting in pain, numbness, or weakness in your leg. If you have mechanical instability of the spine in which it's slipping back and forth, or if you have a substantial deformity of your spine, which is affecting your ability to stand or walk upright. And we'll touch on each of those topics, but these are the reasons you have spine surgery. So this was a patient I saw who was lifting up something heavy at work. If you look at this MRI, you can see this massive disc herniation. So the whole entire disc has blown out. It is compressing the nerves in the back. This person had substantial pain and weakness uh, in her legs due to this herniation. This is a very good reason to have an operation. This person did very, very quite well, did, did well. And we don't treat every disc herniation with surgery. Most disc herniations are treated without an operation. In the absence of progressive pain or weakness in the di distribution of the nerve compressed, we treat these um, herniations with injections and physical therapy successfully 70 to 80% of the time. However, if there's a severe herniation, there's progressive pain in the legs or weakness in the leg in the distribution of the nerve, an operation is by far the best way to treat the problem. This is another indication of a lumbar disc herniation. So this is a patient that had a herniation at the L5 S1 level. This is a normal MRI on the right and on my left is the person that has the herniation at L5 S1. And you can see how this disc is protruding into the spinal canal. They had pain in the S1 distribution, so that's the butt, back of the thigh, calf, and into the lateral border of the foot, and they couldn't stand up on their toes. So this is someone who needed an operation to remove the portion of the disc, which was compressing the nerve. Uh, and this is the kind of the cross-section representation of that. So this is looking at the patient from the side, from the, from the top down, and you can see this large protuberant herniation, which is digging or compressing into the sac. Um, and that would cause pain, numbness, weakness in the legs, an operation to alleviate that is very, very effective. One of the concerns with a large disc herniation is something called cauda equina syndrome. Uh, it's something that I very frequently get called about in the hospital. Uh, and it's when you have a mass, a very large herniation or a mass, which is compressing the nerves in the back. And that can result in difficulty with going to the bathroom, urinary incontinence, numbness in your groin or rectal area. Uh, and it is something that is, needs to be treated emergently. If you have a true cauda equina syndrome, the nerves in, in, your, in your back that supply your bowel and bladder function are being compressed to the point that they or dying, and it can be a permanent problem if it's not addressed in an emergent fashion. This is uncommon, but it does happen. And so this is a, an indication of that. You can see how large this disc herniation is. It is completely occluding the space for the nerves. This person presented with uh, numbness in their groin. Uh, they had substantial weakness and pain in their legs in the S1 distribution, so back of their thigh, uh, into their calf and their feet. Um, and so they required an emergent operation. Hey, Dr. Woods, quick question while we, yes. while we have a break. Uh, Todd asked, how long do disc herniations take to heal? That's a very good question. Um, so there is a whole spectrum of disc herniations. Uh, I see a lot of patients in the office and they read their MRI report. So they get an MRI, they read the report, and they say I have a bulge at every level in my back. And so there's a whole spectrum of disc herniations from a minor bulge to one that's clinically significant. A herniation that is deemed clinically significant is one which is resulting in compression of a nerve in your back. If it's compressing a nerve in your back, that will cause pain or numbness, weakness in your leg. If you look at the natural history study, so thousands of patients who've had disc herniations, most patients who will improve without surgery improve within three months. Some patients can take up to two years to improve in regards to leg pain um, particularly. And so if we look at patients that have leg pain that's persistent or weakness, for more than six weeks typically we do an operation. So the amount of time we generally give somebody is about six weeks. If they're having severe leg pain, 
you start developing weakness, we pull the trigger a lot quicker. But the natural history studies would say it can take up to two years for a disc herniation to, to heal. So this is an MRI um, looking at a, a patient who has two different types of disc herniations. They have an extruded disc fragment. So this is at L5S1. This is a, a very large bulge. That annulus, that outer ring is still intact and that's compressing the nerves. And then above at the L3-4 level, there is an extruded fragment that has been squirted out. And that's kind of the inner gelatinous portion, that nucleus pulposus, which is pension, uh, which is the cushion of the, of the of the disc has been squirted out. So two different types of disc herniations, both cause similar problems, pain, weakness, numbness in the legs. If you look at the cross-sectional view, this illustrates the herniation. So the green circle in the, on, in the center and on either side represent the nerve roots and the thecal sac, the thecal sac being in the center, the nerve roots exiting on either side. And then that red piece is that disc herniation, that fragment, which is within the spinal canal that's pinching the left L3 nerve root that would cause pain in the front of the thigh. This is another kind of representation of what a disc herniation looks like. So on the left, this is a normal MRI. The circle represents the sac. The white is the lubricating fluid. The little dots are the nerve roots. The squares are the nerve roots as they're exiting the spinal column. And then you can kind of see this disc herniation, which is narrowing that space for the nerves that will cause leg pain, weakness. This is someone who underwent an operation and did very, very well. And then this is just to reiterate that point. This is, this is a young lady. She had a very large disc herniation at L5S1. If you look at the MRI on the right, this is the space for the nerves here, which is open at L4-5. And when we get to L5S1, that space is completely occluded. And she presented with pain shooting down her legs, weakness in her legs, difficulty walking. And I did an operation where I removed that portion of the disc and she did it quite, quite well. When we do lumbar decompressions, this can typically be done in a minimally invasive fashion. Uh, our surgical techniques have evolved to the point that we do not necessarily need to cut any muscles. Uh, we spread the muscles, um, remove a portion of the bone, and what you see here is a portion of the disc. This was a piece of disc material which was herniated, and that was removed from this small incision. Quite often, you know, de decompression procedures, microdiscectomies can be done as an outpatient. People go home same day. What is spinal stenosis? So spinal stenosis is a very common uh, problem uh, that I see in, in, in patients on a weekly basis. Essentially what spinal stenosis means is that the space for the nerves is being compressed. That can be compressed by a multitude of things. It can be from a disc herniation. It can be from arthritis, which has developed as a result of disc degeneration. It can be from slippage of the vertebrae. If the bones slip and translate and result in compression of the nerves, that can cause stenosis. Patients that have spinal stenosis um, have difficulty walking. When you walk, the nerves are pinched. It's like trying to walk with someone putting you in a headlock. Uh, and when you, when you ambulate, the oxygen required in the nerves is more. And so when the nerves are compressed, it's hard to do. One of the classic signs of spinal stenosis is that it is difficult to walk upright. It's a little bit easier if you flex forward. And one of the kind of the telltale signs is this shopping cart sign. So you can, you can walk very well if you're leaned over particularly bend over a shopping cart or a walker, but if you have a hard time standing upright, your symptoms typically resolve when you're sitting down. Those are some classic spinal stenosis symptoms. And so these are just some radiographic representations of that. Uh, this is a patient who has a slippage or translation of the vertebrae, the bone is slipped forward. As a result of that translation, Instead of having a circle or an open epidural space, it looks like a triangle. And that represents spinal stenosis. Those nerves are being compressed. This will result in difficulty walking, pain in the legs, weakness in the legs, inability to walk for prolonged periods of time. And this is just, this is a, uh, another uh, image just kind of representing that, uh, a CT myelogram, which kind of shows that instead of this being a circle, this is kind of a triangle. And the, the offending agents in this case are the facet joints. So these are the joints in the back 
that have become arthritic. They've become arthritic because the disc has degenerated. And as those joints grow, they encroach upon the spinal canal, resulting in compression of nerves. Compression of nerves makes it difficult to walk and causes some pain. Again, this is just another representation of that. So this is a patient who has some arthritis of the facet joints, but the canal is still open. And then on the right side, complete occlusion of that sac. You can see how severely compressed the nerves are in this case. And so what the triangle represents is our surgical approach, which is called a laminectomy. So that's to remove the lamina, the, the, the wishbone looking structure in a portion of the facet to open up space for the nerves. This operation is very effective at improving leg pain and ability to walk. These surgeries do not necessarily treat back pain. And I see a lot of patients that come in with back pain. Uh, back pain in and of itself is typically not a good reason to have an operation on your back, except for some minor or rare instances in which there's instability or a big deformity. The reason we typically perform surgery is if there's nerve compression, nerve compression is affecting uh, your ability to walk, causing leg pain or weakness. Uh, so another indication for surgery is instability if the bones are translating or slipping. And so this is a CT scan which shows translation of the L4 on the L5 vertebrae. This is called a spondylolisthesis. This is a fancy term for the bones translating, and that mechanical instability can cause back and leg pain. Uh, and patients that have instability typically have surgery. It's kind of like driving a car with loose lug nuts on, on the tire. The, as you start to walk, the tire is flop, or you start to move or try to go fast, that tire is flopping around. That can damage nerves, that can cause back pain. In the circumstance of instability, when the bones are slipping, we typically perform surgery. And so this is a representation of that. This on the left is an x-ray where the bones have translated at L4-5. This is the MRI. You can see that white fluid is the lubricating fluid. And when we get down to L4-5, it's resulting in stenosis, spinal stenosis. So this person presented with back and leg pain, inability to walk. You can see below, the, the sac opens back up. And so this is a mechanical compression of the nerves. This is a good reason to have an operation. Patients do very well. And so this, this is just kind of illustrating that translation of the vertebrae and the result in spinal stenosis. And the Dr. way we treat it is with, I'm yep. gonna pause after what you're gonna say for a couple other questions. Sure. Um, let's start with two that were here. Um, are there any, we could probably sum this up at the end, but are there any treatments for arthritis in the spine? So yes. First of all, everyone will develop arthritis of the spine to a certain extent. Um, the disc or the cushions between the bones degenerate. That can result in arthritis to varying degrees. Arthritis is very can become significant if it results in compression of nerves. A lot of patients have arthritis that does not necessarily compress nerves, but just causes pain in the back. So our predominant treatment for arthritis, first and foremost, is therapy. Therapy can be frustrating, but it's very important. The reason you do therapy is it improves blood flow, it strengthens the muscles which support the spine, decreases inflammation. Uh, we can also do injections into arthritic segments of the spine, specifically the facet joints that can, that can decrease inflammation and, and um, can help with pain. So we do surgery for arthritis if it pinches nerves. Patients that have diffuse arthritis in the back that does not compress nerves, we treat with anti-inflammatories, therapy, and specific injections, typically. Okay, so this is a, a picture of uh, someone who underwent a fusion. So there's a lot of people, when I tell patients they need rods and screws in their back, they get quite, quite concerned. Uh, and I can understand that sentiment. But the fact of the matter is rods and screws serve as a brace or a cast to hold the bones together. The bones then have to fuse, and once they fuse, they're not slipping forward or anymore. And it's very similar to a broken bone. If you break your leg or you break your arm, we have to place rods and screws to secure the bones so they don't translate or slip. And it's the same thing with the spine. The bones are slipping pathologically. A fusion will stabilize those bones, create a solid base, 
prevent nerve compression, uh, and allow you to strengthen your spine through physical therapy. Uh, one or two or three level fusion typically doesn't result in substantial limitations to motion. Uh, if you start doing longer segment fusion, certainly it can, but a one or two level fusion typically does not affect patient's motion, their abilities to live active and normal lives. This is a, a patient that I saw who had a spondylolisthesis, so a translation of the bones at the L4-5 level, meaning that this is L3-4, the bones are aligned here. At L4-5, the bone is slipping. She had a lot of leg pain and weakness on the right side, and her MRI showed a massive cyst, which had developed from her facet joint that was compressing the nerve in her back, and it was affecting her ability to walk. Uh, and so she underwent an operation to remove that cyst uh, and stabilize the bones, and she did quite, quite well. This is another example. Uh, this is a little bit of a different problem. This is a spondylolisthesis. So if you look at this, the green arrow represents the disc space. You can see how large that disc is. The circle represents the neuroforamen. That's where the exiting nerve comes out. This gentleman came in with substantial back pain and leg pain in his L5 distribution. Pain shooting down the side of his leg uh, into his foot. And the reason being is that arrow at the top of the screen represents a crack or a defect in the pars. The pars is the portion of the bone that connects the vertebral segments. The arrow on the bottom shows that that disc has collapsed completely. And so if you look at the disc above compared to the disc below, that, that disc is collapsed. And as a result, the red circle, the neuroforamen has been compromised. So that space for the nerve in his back has been limited substantially. So that nerve is now pinched and he has a tremendous amount of leg pain. This is his MRI. And if you look at this MRI in first glance, it doesn't look so bad. His spinal canal is pretty open. We can see white fluid all the way up and down his spine. However, if you look closely and you look at the neuroforamen, you will see that his nerve is pinched. This is the L4 nerve root where my clicker is on here. You can see how much space there is for that nerve. This is the L5 nerve root, and you can see that nerve is being very substantially compressed because the bones have slipped. So I took him and did an operation in which we placed the inner body spacer and rods and screws. You can see how it's opened up that space for the nerve, uh, and he went back to a normal life working out and uh, did quite, quite well. Uh, another reason that we do surgery uh, occasionally is for trauma. I see a lot of people with broken bones, and there's a whole continuum from fractures that I see. Fractures that affect transverse processes. So this is a break of a transverse process. This guy fell off the ladder. This portion of the bone is not needed for stability of the spinal column. It's treated without surgery. This is an osteoporotic compression fracture. I see this very commonly, most common in women uh, who are postmenopausal. It happens because after you go through menopause, you don't make estrogen. You, estrogen protects bones, so your bones get soft. And so even minor events like sitting down on a chair or a ground level fall can result in a fracture of the bone because the bone is soft. Compression fractures are treated medically. They are treated with medications to strengthen the bones, nutrition to help the bones to heal, and physical therapy. Compression fractures, fractures are not treated with surgery. This is a medical problem. And the medical problem is that the bones are too soft. Then I see fractures like this, which is a burst fracture. So you can see this bone is completely collapsed. There's a huge portion of the bone which is ex extruded into the spinal canal. As a result, it's narrowing the space for the nerves. This person presented with profound pain and weakness in their legs, inability to walk. That's something which requires surgical intervention. And then the worst case scenario is a fracture dislocation where the spinal column has been translated. Patients that typically have this level of injury have pretty substantial weakness in their large extremities. Uh, and this is just kind of another representation. You can see this spine is completely dislocated. Unfortunately, I do see these type of injuries and they can be quite devastating. Uh, we do the best we can to put them back together. Um, this is a lady that I saw that has a burst fracture. So she was in a motor vehicle accident. You can see this bone is cracked in half. As a result, bone is pushed into the spinal canal. She had substantial pain and weakness in her leg. She couldn't walk. This is the MRI showing 
the nerves would compress in her back. And so she underwent an operation to remove that fractured bone, to place rods and screws to stabilize her spinal column, and she actually did quite well and is able to ambulate without assistance or a cane. Another reason that we may consider to do an operation is because of a scoliotic curve. So scoliosis is fairly common, and there's a lot of patients who have scoliosis who do not need surgery. The reason we would consider doing surgery for a scoliotic patient is if, as a result of their deformity, they have severe compression of the nerves. You can imagine this scoliosis, if the nerves are coming out the side, how severely compressed those nerves could be. So patients that have severe compression of nerves as a result of their deformity, or if they can't stand upright. And, you know, we very frequently want to focus on that frontal view, but it's actually the side view which is more important. And God designed us in a way in which our heads are over our butt. And that requires a curve in the thoracic spine, which is called kyphosis, and lordosis in the lumbar spine, which compensates and keeps our head over our butt. And what can happen is, when we develop these deformities, people start falling forward. And so they can't stand upright because they've lost those normal curves in their spine. Their spine becomes straight and they can't stand upright. So our body attempts to compensate through that by what's called pelvic retroversion. But that's a very difficult way to walk for prolonged periods of time. Uh, and so patients that we consider surgery on with scoliosis have either substantial malalignment issues where they can't stand up or they have severe nerve compression. This is a gentleman that I saw that had both. So you can see his scoliosis, you can see his curve. Uh, he is, his head is still pretty much over his butt, but he is compensated through kind of retroverting his pelvis. I know that's a fancy way to say it, but essentially he, his, his pelvis has, has, has been kicked back so he can stay upright, but he fatigues very easily. And he had very severe stenosis in his spine. So you can see here the space for the nerves, particularly at these couple levels here, has been completely occluded. So he had a lot of pain and weakness in his legs. Uh, and so um, I took him to surgery to address that stenosis and address that malalignment in his back. Uh, and he did incredibly well. He was able to walk uh, much better than he did before. These operations are not for everybody. I can tell you for every 10 patients that I see with this type of problem, maybe one gets this surgery. And we take these things very, very seriously. Just because you have a scoliosis does not mean you need an operation. And I'm not for a second saying that everyone needs this type of procedure. And we at the Rothman Institute do the best that we can to do the least amount of surgery possible. However, there are circumstances where these type of reconstructions are required. Uh, and if it is needed, we will do it. If it's not needed, we will not do it. I can tell you, I've, I've seen patients who were told that they needed these big reconstructive procedures, and I did a very small procedure just to remove pressure from the nerves, and they did quite well. And so that's why it's very important for us to sit down in the office to talk about what the actual problem is uh, so we can devise an individualized plan to treat your problem, because this is not always required. Uh, if it is required, we have the ability to do it. I see very commonly patients with back pain. Back pain is very common. In the patients that typically, that most of the horror stories that you hear, patients who have back surgery who didn't do well, typically is for back pain as an indication. Patients who have pure back pain in the absence of leg pain or weakness and no neurologic compression should not have an operation. And so this is a prime example. This is a guy that came in. He saw another surgeon. The surgeon went to fuse his back. He has disc degeneration. So his discs are dark at L4-5 and L5-S1. They're degenerating. The rest of his discs are pretty healthy. His spinal canal is open, and he had just back pain. He was a young guy. Uh, and um, fusion for this is very controversial. This is the type of procedure which it's really a roll of the dice in that some people get better, some people don't. And so we at Rothman really try to focus on operations that we know will help people. And that is for patients with nerve compression, with mechanical instability, with severe deformities. Axial back pain is a, is a, is a hard thing to fix. And I, I talk people out of surgery all the time for disc degeneration and back pain. 
uh, it's not typically a good reason um, to have an operation. Another reason that I have to do surgery occasionally, particularly in Atlantic City, is for infection. Uh, infections of the spine can happen. They frequently happen in IV drug abusers, but I can tell you they can happen in anybody. The disc I told you is aneural. That means it doesn't have any nerves, but it also does not have blood vessels. So our immune protection comes through blood, and the disc has no ability to get blood to it except through the end plates on the vertebral bodies. And so it is a safe harbor for bacteria. So someone that gets bacteremic or an infection in their blood that can seed their disc, if that disc becomes infected and pusses out, it can result in pus in the spinal canal. And that's something which is treated surgically to eliminate or remove that pus if it's resulting in nerve compression. If, the, if they have an infection that's not um, resulting in compression of the nerves, oftentimes it can be treated with antibiotics. But this is an intraoperative picture kind of illustrating pus within the spinal canal that had to be evacuated as this lady presented with inability to walk. So we're going to switch over to cervical pathology now. Is there any other questions um, before I keep going, um, Nicole or Leslie? None on my end. Thank you. Okay, cool. So we'll keep going. You guys uh, put any text questions up if you, if you have any. So cervical spine is similar to the lumbar spine. Nerve roots in the neck supply different portions of your arm. So patients come in and they have arm pain or weakness. It can be from a nerve root compression. The difference between the cervical spine and lumbar spine is the spinal cord is in the cervical spine. So the spinal cord is central that's the information highway between the brain and the body, and then the nerve roots supply specific portions of your arm. Uh, and this is a graphical representation of that. So just like the legs, someone that comes with, you know, pain in their arm, I am trying to put the puzzle together to figure out where their compression of their nerve is. Uh, we have a lot of things that we can do in the neck that are quite effective. Um, one is motion preservation surgery. So this is a young lady who came in she has a pretty normal looking cervical spine. Uh, her disc spaces are all pretty symmetric. She does not have substantial arthritis and she had a large disc herniation. So this right here is a disc herniation which is compressing her nerve. She had severe pain and weakness in her arm. Her spinal cord wasn't severely compressed. And so I took her to surgery to remove that disc herniation and did a disc replacement on her. Uh, that preserves motion at that segment. Her arm pain was resolved. Um, and uh, the benefit of these disc replacement operations is that they preserve micro motion uh, and decrease rates of adjacent segment degeneration or the likelihood that you'll need more surgery down the line. Again, this is not a surgery for everybody. Uh, we have to have a tailored approach to each and, in, each and every patient. Uh, if you have substantial arthritis, you don't want a disc replacement, you want a fusion. And people dread or the thought of a fusion but you know, the analogy that I give my patients is you don't put a new tire on a bent rim because the car won't roll very well. And so if you got arthritis, you want a fusion that stabilizes the bones. If there's not substantial arthritis, but there is nerve compression and an operation to remove that pressure and then preserve that motion uh, is the best case scenario. And so at Rothman, whatever is best is what's gonna happen for you. That's what we'll do. Uh, this is another, so this is a I'm very sorry, similar. Dr. Woods, I am going to interrupt. It seems like people were, were typing their questions and I spoke too soon. Um, when is a laminectomy, laminectomy warranted versus a laminotomy? And what types, what are the recuperation times for them? So a laminectomy and a laminotomy are very similar procedures. A laminotomy would imply that you remove a portion of the laminectomy of the lamina. The lamina is the bone which protects the spinal column. Let me see if I can find. So this, this right here, this wishbone is the lamina. So in this circumstance, this patient would need a laminectomy because they have severe central stenosis. So a laminectomy, you have to remove the entire portion of the bone. A laminotomy is when you only make a window in the bone. Uh, and a laminotomy is typically done if you have a disc herniation and you can just pull it out through a smaller a smaller window. A laminectomy is done if there's more severe central stenosis. Uh, and if it's just a one-level laminectomy or and compared to a one-level laminotomy, the recovery times are pretty similar. 
if you have you need a multi-level laminectomy, so someone has stenosis, compression at multiple levels, then that can be a longer recovery, typically six, eight, sometimes even 12 weeks. So laminectomy, laminotomy are similar. The only difference is with a laminectomy, you have to remove more bone. Another question is, can you briefly discuss non-surgical interventions for spinal stenosis? Yes. So non-surgical interventions for spinal stenosis, first and foremost, is physical therapy. If you look at the literature, physical therapy does have an ability to improve patients with spinal stenosis. The way that it works is through core stabilization, through improving strength in the muscles that support the spine, improving blood flow, which decreases inflammation. And the vast majority of patients with spinal stenosis are treated conservatively with physical therapy as the foundation, steroid injections to decrease inflammation within the spinal canal, and anti-inflammatory medication. Most of the patients that we see, that's how we treat them. The reason that we would proceed to surgery is someone who failed those treatments, who had progressive leg pain or weakness, that's when we do an operation. With physical therapy, injections, and anti-inflammatories or the foundational treatment, there are a lot of other treatments uh, for, for spinal stenosis, but those, for sure, are the foundational treatments. And the last question I have on my end, as far as low back pain, if there is no isolated stiffness or leg pain, how do you differentiate if this is a muscle issue or a disc issue? And in that diagnosis, is an MRI always necessary? That's a great question. So first of all, you, typically insurance companies will not approve an MRI for isolated back pain. If you have purely back pain, you're gonna have a hard time getting an MRI. Uh, the way we differentiate discogenic pain versus muscular pain is through physical examination. Tenderness to palpation in the lumbar spine is gonna be consistent with a muscle problem. Uh, if you're palpating the back and there's no pain elicited, then it may be a deeper structure, a facet joint, or a disc. Also, certain loading um, um, evaluations, having people flex and extend, um, you can differentiate discogenic pain versus muscular pain. The, the thought that pain is coming from the disc, it's been proven, but it is it can be difficult to, to kind of differentiate the two in a person with a normal MRI. There are patients that have kind of disc degeneration, normal MRI that we will send for a diagnostic injection. So if I send you, you have back pain, a normal MRI, maybe a little disc degeneration, and we send you for an epidural injection, that steroid is going around the disc. If that improves your pain, that would be one method that we can differentiate muscular pain from discogenic pain. The vast majority of the back pain we see is muscular, not discogenic. I'm sorry, one more. It is a little specific, but I think um, issues to sciatica pain are very frequently brought up. So a pain located in the buttocks that has not responded to injections or to PT, what would you say the, the possible cause or future treatment plan should be? So if you have buttock pain, which is not radiating down your leg, a very common source of that pain is the SI joint. The sacroiliac joint is the joint which connects the pelvis to the spine. So this is an x-ray in the middle. This is the SI joint here. And so pain purely in the buttock can be from the SI joint. A way that you can differentiate that is by physical examination, stressing that joint, see if it causes pain. Another way we can kind of determine if that's the source of the pain is providing an injection into the sacroiliac joint to see if that improves the pain. Thank you. I'll let you proceed to cervical, and if I get any more um, low back questions, we will either save them for the end, or I will respond to people at the um, once the lecture is done. Thank you. Okay. So um, just to, just so motion preservation is something we try to do. If you have someone with a disc herniation, nerve compression, no arthritis, this is a patient who has arthritis. The disc is collapsed here at the C5-6 level. If you look at this level. Compared to the level above, you can see how it's kind of a bird beak appearance. The disc is collapsed, uh, and she has a large disc herniation was denting her spinal cord. This is a patient that needs a fusion. You have arthritis, um, a disc replacement is not the best treatment. Uh, and so 
it's a tailored approach. We look at the alignment of your, ne your neck, we look at the presence or absence of arthritis, we look at nerve compression. As with the black back, not everybody we see that has a disc herniation requires surgery. But if that compression is resulting in, is, is resulting in pain or weakness in an arm, that's not getting better or compression of the spinal cord. We have different ways to remove that pressure uh, to uh, alleviate the problem. Another common problem I see is spinal cord compression. Spinal cord compression uh, can affect balance, strength, and dexterity. And it ha often happens in people as they age and they attribute weakness or clumsiness to just getting old, but the fact of the matter is their spinal cord's compressed. If you look at this MRI, this is someone with severe spinal cord compression. Look at the bottom, you can see how much space there is for that spinal cord. And in their mid thoracic spine, or excuse me, cervical spine, that spinal cord is being compressed substantially. Uh, this patient presented with inability to button her shirt. They were dropping objects, they were very unsteady. And so she underwent an operation to remove that pressure from her spinal cord. You can see the difference between the two. That allows the spinal cord to breathe and to heal. It prevents the patient from losing more function, and we hope over time some of the function that was lost is gained. Uh, and so with spinal cord compression, where you start is where you finish. So if you do have compression of your spinal cord, typically we're pretty aggressive about removing that pressure from, to prevent you from getting worse and having permanent deficits. There's a bunch of different ways we can do that. We can do it through fusion or non-fusion options. And this is an example of a laminoplasty or when the spine is hinged open. So this is a plate kind of hinging open the lamina. Underneath here is the spinal cord, uh, which uh, you know it now is decompressed, the pressure is off. And this is a non-fusion option. This is essentially a way to open up space for the spinal column. So this spinal column is hinged open to open up space for the spine. So this is a non-fusion option that's sometimes appropriate for patients that have spinal cord compression. This on the right is an example of a fusion. This patient required a fusion and she has a plate on the front and the back, whereas on the left side, this is the laminoplasty or the non-fusion option. Uh, again, the goal of these operations is first and foremost to remove pressure for the spinal cord. And there's a number of ways we can do that. And we sit down and discuss what the best appropriate and least invasive option is for you, and that, that's what we do. Uh, some of the advances in surgery um, recently, um, we have multimodal analgesic protocol. Essentially, you know, we have realized kind of the problems with opioid narcotics, and so we try to limit the need for opioid narcotics before and after these operations. Blood loss prevention uh, is something that we have really come a long way with in, in our ability to do these surgeries, in which you don't have to lose much blood, lose much blood, and a continuum of that is minimally invasive surgery. So this was a study I did when I was uh, at University of Pittsburgh, where I did my residency, and we looked at patients that lost a lot of blood during surgery, and we found that those patients had higher risk of complications like infections, particularly patients that require blood transfusions. And so there are a number of ways that we limit blood loss in surgery. Transexamic acid is something that we can give before the operation to limit blood loss. It's not very frequently used, but for very large operations, we use it. Aquamanus is a device that we use in surgery that cauterizes the tissues and prevents blood loss. And then the cell saver is something that I use very frequently. That is where we recycle the blood that you lose, your own blood, and give it back to you in the operation. And that prevents the need or the likelihood for us having to give you a transfusion of blood that's not yours. And then finally, it is minimally invasive surgery in which we are very delicate with your tissues and make very small incisions and can successfully alleviate pressure without disrupting the tissues and muscles that surround your spinal column. And you know, this is frequently how we used to have to do operations, very large uh, open incisions. Uh, and we are much better now about preserving soft tissues and doing smaller operations so we can get you up and moving quicker. Uh, and this is an example of a minimally invasive surgery. So this is a keyhole. This is about the size of a quarter uh, in which I had to go in and remove pressure. This is someone's nerve root. They had a large disc herniation, which was removed. And this can be done through very, very small incisions. Uh, endoscopic surgery is something that uh, is, we explore and we occasionally do, and that allows us to use cameras and to remove pressure from nerves, again, through very, very small portals. 
So in summary, um, indications for surgery, neurologic compression, instability, sometimes fracture, not always, uh, and then deformity or infection. Back pain in and of itself is not something we typically do surgery for. Come to the Rothman Institute if you have a problem with your back. We will sit down. We will give you an individual uh, approach. Not everybody is treated the same. If we can be treated conservatively, we will. If it needs surgery, there's not a better place to get that done. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, Dr. Woods, a question that came in, when is nerve ablation appropriate? That's a good question. And a lot of people are confused about this, but a nerve ablation would imply that you're emblating the facet joint. So the facet joint is the joint in your back um, that can become arthritic. So when you're ablating a nerve, you're actually ablating the, the joint that innervates the facet joint. And when we do facet ablations or radio frequency ablations, that's for a patient that has arthritis in their back, they have back pain, not leg pain, and they have an injection into the facet joint, which temporary, temporarily alleviates their pain. So that would indicate that the arthritic, arthritic joint is the source of their pain. Uh, in that circumstance, you can do a radio frequency ablation where you permanently numb that joint. So you're ablating the nerve that innervates that joint, and that can help for back pain. So we do radio frequency ablations on patients who have back or neck pain, who have facet mediated problems, meaning that the pain is coming from the joint and that is confirmed by an injection, which gives them temporary improvement in the pain. Dr. Woods, another good question. Um, it was asked, since most problems requiring surgery involve nerve damage or pinching, why an orthopedic spine surgeon over a neurosurgeon? I mean, that's a very common question that, that we get. Um, you know, you need a spinal surgeon to take care of spinal problems. There's two ways that you can become a spinal surgeon. One is to become trained as an orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedic surgery uh, residency deals with treatment of bone disorders, arthritis, fractures, and then also the spinal column. And then after completing a, a orthopedic residency, you have to do a fellowship specialized in spinal surgery. Um, neurosurgery is the same in that they, they treat nerves, they also treat the brain. The spinal surgery is the same. The indications for surgery are the same. We at the Rothman Institute, just about every spine surgeon we have on staff at Rothman Institute has been trained in both orthopedic spine as well as neurosurgery spine. My fellowship at the Rothman Institute, I was trained in both departments. Most of us hold dual appointments in neurosurgery and orthopedic spine. But at the end of the day, you need someone who is specialized in spinal surgery. And everyone that does spine surgery at Rothman Institute is a specialized spinal surgeon. We have the ability to take care of nerves. That's what we do every day of, of the week. So there's not a, if it's a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic spine surgeon, if they are fellowship trained in spinal surgery, they have the ability to take care of this problem. Dr. Woods, any of the surgeries that you described, is there any age restrictions to them or recommendations of when a person may be too old to have the procedure? I mean, we've heard the adage that age is nothing but a number. And when it comes to spine, that is true. What makes my decision as in regards to someone having surgery or not is not necessarily their, necessarily their age. I have operated on people in their 90s, and then I have people in their 50s who I refuse to do surgery on. There are physiologic considerations that you have to take into account. How healthy is somebody? How active is somebody? Um, you know, what is actually their problem? There is a lot of data which would support people in their 80s and even in their 90s uh, who have severe nerve compression who are healthy do incredibly well with surgery. As a matter of fact, I have a gentleman tomorrow who's 91 years old that I'm doing a lumbar laminectomy on. He has severe stenosis and leg pain. Uh, and so uh, I anticipate that he will do very, very well. So age is one consideration, but the things that we take into account is the totality of the patient's picture, their medical history, um, you know, how long they've had the problem, you know, what is their preoperative level of function, how disabled are they as a result of the problem. Age is one consideration, but it's not the primary consideration. So I have plenty of patients who are in their 80s and 90s that have had spine surgery and have done very, very well. 
Uh, let's do a couple more, Les. Um, Dr. Woods, can you contrast spinal stenosis versus foraminal stenosis? Good question. That's a very good question. That's one probably done best with the picture. So central stenosis means that there is compression of the, of the central spinal canal. So when you have central stenosis, every nerve root below that level is going to be compressed. So this is a great example. This is a guy that had a spondylolisthesis at L5-S1. If you look at his MRI, his spinal canal is wide open at L5-S1. He has no central stenosis. I can see plenty of space here. He has foraminal stenosis. The neural foramen is where the nerve exits the spine. So this person would have pain isolated in the distribution of the L5 nerve root. If you have, central, if you have spinal stenosis, which is central, that will affect multiple nerve roots. Any nerve below that level could potentially be affected. You have foraminal stenosis, that's only gonna affect that exiting nerve root, which is being compressed. So this is an example of somebody who has no central stenosis, their spinal canal is wide open, but they have severe foraminal stenosis in which the nerve is compressed. Okay, Dr. Woods, can you briefly, um talk about the recovery time for a laminectomy. When can someone expect to walk reasonable distances and kind of return to normal function as they, they want it to? Well, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, for most patients, normal recovery from a laminectomy is between six and 12 weeks. But the factors which influence that include how long the duration of symptoms, how long has this person had the problem, how debilitated are they before? Um, you know, how functional were they before? What type of medical problems they have? All that goes into the recovery time. But most patients that have a simple laminectomy, um, by six weeks typically, they're, they're, I would say 80% of patients are doing quite well. There is certainly a, a continuum. Some patients go much quicker, some people, people take longer. Uh, and there are individual patient factors which influence that and that can be discussed during a consultation. But for most patients between six and 12 weeks of simple laminectomy, um, they're, they're, back, they're back to their, their pre-injury status. Um, I don't know what the condition is here, but what strategies have been found po uh, effective post-PT to avoid further injuries but allow near return to a more active lifestyle? Looking to avoid routine PT. I mean, there's, you, can't, you can't avoid physical therapy. I mean, I tell, patients tell me all the time, I did physical therapy for four weeks, doc, my back still hurts. No one ever got strong in four weeks. And I think the analogy with physical therapy is, it's like a penny. You do physical therapy one day that you have one penny. And you put a penny in the bank every day, eventually you will accumulate something. The purpose of physical therapy is to give you some guidance, uh, is to kind of, give you direction for the things that you need to do. And then even after physical therapy is done, you should continue to do those exercises. And if you continue to do those exercises over time, you'll have something meaningful. Or lower extremity strength and exercises that strengthen core, decrease uh, inflammation, improve blood flow. Those are tried and true methods to treat spinal pathology, particularly stenosis, instability, arthritis. There's not a shortcut to that. You know, I know we want a shortcut, but there's no shortcut to putting in the work to do those things. Thank you, Dr. Woods. I did in the chat list um, your link to our website. People want to read your bio again. It does include your office location, your surgical locations, um, and then the VIP scheduling number there in the chat, and I'll read that number off. It is 609-952-5243. Nicole, did you have any other questions on your end? Nothing here. I think I think this was very informative. Um, some good feedback. They said, Dr. Woods, that you made a very complex topic understandable. So thank you for that. I think this was great. My pleasure. My pleasure. Anytime. All right.
right, so I guess that concludes our event for tonight. Um, thank you, Dr. Woods. Thank you, Leslie, for your help with this. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, this lecture was recorded, so we will be sending out the recording via email, um, typically by early next week. So be on the lookout for um, an email. It'll come from, from Rothman Orthopedics. Um, with that link, you can you know, pass it on to friends, share it with whomever um, may find it valuable. And it'll also contain that same phone number that Leslie mentioned and um, a link for Dr. Woods' profile as well. So again, thank you for joining us this evening. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks, everybody. God bless. Be safe.